we're going to get Rob in here in just a couple of minutes. So just hang in there and stand by with us. Uh, Rob is a great guy. He is an Atlanta-based attorney, but he found this little niche. And that's something I'd love to ask him about. It's like, how did you land in all of the different types of law? How did you land in wedding law? And the... Um, uh, but he is the go-to resource for the industry with all things legal that somehow have to do with the wedding business. Now, I've, Rob and I are on the speaking circuit. We see each other a couple times a year, see him at Wedding MBA. Uh, really got to know him a couple of years ago at Wedding MBA because not only were we both speaking, but we our booths were next to each other. And... Uh, uh, we even like, we were actually speaking back to back and he ended up with my speaker's gift and I ended up with his and we kind of traded them a few months later when we opened up the boxes to see, uh, I got, uh, thank you, Rob, for the great job. And he got, thank you, Mark. And, uh, so we traded that. So that's my little Rob story, but, uh, really good guy and really knows his stuff. And so we've got, um, We've got a few things that we're going to um, that we're going to ask him, and we want your questions too. So I'm just looking off to the side here. Well, I can to, first um, talk a little bit more about him. Um, Rob Shank, as you said, is an in, in attorney in Atlanta, but he is called the Wedding Lawyer, and he is also running a YouTube. Uh, site, a channel that is called Wedding Industry Law, and that's a podcast. And I've got to tell you, if you are running a business today, you should be looking at his his YouTube videos. He has 19 running right now, and there are probably half of them you should definitely listen to. For those of you just joining us, um, we're waiting for our speaker to show up. We've had some technical glitches, which is welcome to the year 2020. Well, he has shown up. He, it's not oh, yeah. that he's not showing up. We're just trying to get him patched into the program here. Yeah. So, so we don't know what's going on. Um, I'm going to let you talk because um, Rob's on the phone. Okay. All right. Well, um, so we're going to talk about some things, and we we really hope to uh, get him on here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, of course, COVID nineteen has brought together. Or, or brought up a whole lot of different challenges in this wedding industry. And uh, a lot of wedding pros are kind of learning things that they wish they would have had in their contracts. And even though they're not in there now, now is the best time to, uh, to fix those things. And Rob's gonna give us some advice on doing that. And if you, um, if you have any questions for Rob, you can post them in in the chat with um, on the Facebook Live. And so I'm winging it. I am winging it. All right. So normally we'd stick our little commercial in at the end of the presentation, and we may still do that. But this webinar or Facebook Live tonight is being presented by Team Wedding. Uh, Team Wedding is a marketing agency for wedding professionals. And so if you would love to do more of what you do and less of the monotony of doing the marketing, then Team Wedding just might be the option for you. Uh, it would allow you to fire your marketing team, even if that marketing team is just you. So head over to teamwedding.com and check out what we do. There's a really cute video there that explains in a nutshell what Team Wedding does. And you'll see our offerings, uh, the pricing page uh, with very special uh Knowing the challenges that the wedding industry is facing now, we have some special pricing uh, for a limited time. And best of all, we are offering a free wedding marketing checkup. And 
again, absolutely free. We're going to take a look at what you do in your marketing. We are going to take a look at uh, your social media, your website, your marketing materials, whatever you'd like us to look at. And we will take a look at those things. And then we're going to come back in a judgment-free zone and give you some uh, practical advice on improving your marketing. And so that just head over to teamwedding.com and sign up for your free marketing checkup. And hey, I see that Rob has joined us. I, I have. Uh, hi, Mark. Hopefully everybody can hear me. If not see me as well. Can you hear him, Mark? I can hear him. It's a little low. We can see you perfect. Okay. What about how, how are we doing now? Does that help you? There we go. That's perfect. We got this. Okay. We well, have this is, intro. Oh, you did the intro already? They know okay. everything about you. They know about your podcast. Did I say that he's looking for more subscribers because he's got to get to a thousand, that magical thousand where you get to do YouTube lives? Please like and subscribe. Wedding Industry Law on YouTube. Mark talked about a whole bunch of stuff. You'll have to catch it on the replay. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I just don't know. This is the thing is like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an old man, but like we've made it to the point now where my phone interface is easier to use than this computer that I'm, I'm literally in front of my computer, which will not let me into this room. But anyway, enough of the trials and tribulations. Thank you guys so much for for inviting me to talk about this stuff. I appreciate it very much. Well, we, like Mark said, we've known you from a while from the whole wedding MBA track and speaking and, um, and we're here and we're just here to help wedding professionals. They are, you know, they want to make cakes. They want to do flowers. They want to be a DJ. They don't want to have uh, a master's in business or law. And um, what we're going to do, we have a few questions to ask you. We're going to take questions from, Anybody that wants to uh, come in and, and give us their questions, um, they can go on to the Facebook. I think Mark, it looks like Mark is monitoring today all the questions. So anything you have, um, but we already talked about your podcast and how there's 19 videos there. So you're- just Post a comment if you have, a, just post in the comments if you have a question for Rob and then we'll, uh, we'll read those uh, to him, sorry. Right. And, and here's the disclaimer that I need to put at the bottom. Statements made on this website are for general information purposes only and are not intended as legal advice of any sort of specific case or legal matter. And the reason for that is why, Rob? The reason for that is because I don't want somebody to uh, take what I say to apply it to their exact situation when I don't know all the variables. I'm going to give you what happens if variable A, B, and C. But most importantly, I'm not licensed in every state. So uh, depending on where you're sitting, I couldn't even give you the advice anyway. So let's just say that we'll take this as an educational program versus literal legal advice for your literal specific situation. Right. Okay. Well, one of the things um, I know we wanted to talk about was contracts. And Mark and I were both individually um, wedding professionals in our other lives before we came, became wedding show producers and wedding marketers and business marketers. So I know personally, I'm sure Mark never did this, but <laughs> I would take, you did. Okay. So, so this I, 25 years, I did a whole bunch of different things from wedding planning to balloon decorating, to being a florist, to having a tuxedo shop. So I did a whole bunch of things. And with my contracts, I took a little bit, from here and a little bit from there and I Frankensteined it and then I borrow something and I've been seeing that going on in the Facebook groups because of this force majeure because everybody all of a sudden has an attention to their contracts in a way they never did before so the concern is what are they doing they're they're just putting a whole bunch of things together and hoping something sticks and that's our concern is are these things going to hold up what's the best way to do this these days to protect yourself. So I guess from a broad standpoint, is it better to have no contract or a contract that you've pieced together through Facebook groups? And the answer is gonna depend, but um, the reason why it's important to start from, if you can afford it, go to a lawyer. If you can find a lawyer that deals with the event industry and in business, even better. Because I like to say that the event industry is special. Okay, so there are going to be contract terms 
that are specific to the event industry. A force majeure clause in an event specific contract is going to be for a client contract is going to be different than you know when Apple buys some startup company. The force majeure clause is going to look different because it, there's there's different obligations. So you're dealing with an event. So you know that's of an event uh, contract to be different from any other type of contract. And then even within the space, okay, a florist has different needs than a videographer. A florist has got to deal with seasonal changes, with customs not allowing tulips in for a certain amount of, of the year, um, these type of things. So even within the event space, you have different components. Even within florists, florist A is probably more likely to be sued about X, Y, and Z than florist B because of how they handle themselves. And that needs to be reflected from that particular florist's contract. So when you're stealing stuff from other things, from other places, from the internet, it doesn't matter, you might be missing the fact that it's not event specific. You might be missing the fact that it doesn't have to do with videographers, it has to do with planners. And then even within that, you might not need um, you know, a particular type of liquidated damages clause that a hotel needs or whatever, or for the next person on the street that does the same thing that you do. So, I, I mean, are you protected by having a contract that you piece together more than not? Probably, but depending on where you stole it and, and how you got it, you might end up in more trouble than you would have been if you hadn't done that. Hopefully that's a good explanation. And you said you to find a good lawyer that does that in your state. You're obviously Georgia is your licensing. I am. I'm one of the rare, um, you know, masochists that took the bar exam in five states. I'm actually licensed in California, <laughs> New York, Florida, Tennessee, and Georgia. Okay, well, um, you're out for Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I, I uh, look. I have uh, a, a network of people that I refer to that I only want to give people um, attorneys that deal with the industry and have um, uh, experience with it and, and charge flat fees. I think that's an important thing. So yes, it's important to get somebody that knows what they're doing. It's the same as you know when you guys were doing the when you guys were in the industry. You know, you want to make sure that you know you you if, if the client comes to you, you want them to know, hey, I've been a DJ for twenty years. I'm mm -hmm. better than the DJ that's been around for one year of it. Only mm -hmm. does, you know, bar mitzvahs versus weddings versus, you know, whatever the case may be. Right. Well, speaking about being in the industry, um, liquidated damages. Um, I listened to that whole video. That's a great one. Like I, I was telling them there's probably 10 on there on your YouTube channel that is a must listen to for people that want to be in business. Um, and then there's some really current event ones. And, you know, you learn from all of them, but 10 must. When we're talking about liquidated damages, Mark, can you help me with th this question? Because I went over this question with him beforehand. When I was a florist, I know part of that, and, and maybe you can do a little background and explain my question I'm about to ask. My question is, I know one of the caveats with that is that you must have to have done something and holding a date isn't enough to get your... To, to prove that you did something. If I'm doing free consultation for my wedding flowers ahead of time, and then I take their deposit, their money, and then within one week, they cancel, they found a better deal or something, how can I prove that I earned it if my consultation was free? And within one week, I really didn't do anything yet. So is that a problem to say my consultations are free? When they're well, really work done, in my mind. Well, they, they, okay, so it's a good question. So if I understand correctly, because this is going to be critical to the answer. Um, so you advertise, I got a free consultation. They, they, they give you money, and then they sign the contract, and then you give them that consultation, and then a week later they, they fire you? I'm, I'm trying to figure out where we're yeah, This order is, in the florist world, a lot of times we're doing the consultation for free ahead of time. That might be an hour and a half to really do. It's more, it's more like a sales yeah. step in the sales process. Yeah. You're doing the consultation. They like what they see. They sign the contract, reserve the date, sign the contract, give you a deposit. And then they, and they, and they, they terminate it a week later. Yeah. Okay. And, if, and if I, if this liquidated damages is in that contract, I'm saying that I, from what I learned from you, I've actually worked for them 
But a good lawyer would say, well, what did you do? The consultation was free. Okay. Okay. I think I'm, I'm with everybody now. Okay. So, okay. Excellent question, right? So um, just for the uninitiated, really quickly, the liquidated damages is the concept in which the parties agree that should a, a, one of the parties breach the contract, in this instance, cancel the wedding, then the other party, the agreed party, would be entitled to a certain amount of money, okay? Typically in the event industry, you guys call that a deposit, okay? It's an amount of money that stays with you if the client cancels the event on their own accord. We're not, the force majeure is, we'll set that aside. This is where we just don't like, we don't like each other anymore. Uh, and the couple, the couple doesn't like each other more. They're cheating on each other. It doesn't matter. They cancel the wedding. Okay. The, to go to your statement, the, the idea of the liquidated damages is to not have to worry about proving to somebody how much you're worth or what you've done. So if your contract is explicit, like, you know, I will accept X percentage of the contract the day that you sign it. And then I'm going to get another one or whatever the case may be. But if you cancel, I'm going to keep that first installment or however you work. it. You are telling the world that don't be concerned with whether or not my consultation was free. Don't be concerned if I've only worked five minutes, 30 minutes, 16 days. We have both decided beforehand that that initial payment will cover me if you cancel. Does that make sense? Yes. So if they, if they come back and say, hey, I canceled a week later, what could you possibly have done? Well, I could have possibly foregone another opportunity. I could have possibly hired somebody else. I could, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The whole point of this is I don't have to tell you what I've done because it's hard to do upfront. So when, when things happen, they cancel like that and the florist wants to keep it or the wedding professional wants to keep that money. If their contract states, as you said, they are totally justified to do so. And if they choose to give the refund, then that's up to them. If it's worded correctly, absolutely. That's that's what that's what it's for. Because there's a misconception with the the society that oh, I'm canceling this contract that I have with this wedding florist. They're excited about that because they don't have to work. No, man, that's how I make my money. Like I'm ex I'm anticipating full contract value because I pull a profit from it. Mm -hmm. So when you cancel that, I'm losing that profit. So at least instead of having to sue you to get that. We're going to agree that I'm going to at least keep this to salvage some value. Mm -hmm. right. Mark, I'm going okay. to. Okay, we've got a question that came in, and um, so I'm sure, Rob, that you, you know, no one likes paying an attorney to do stuff for them. That's like, I mean, that's the you know, a lot of businesses they want to do things the cheapest way, and we talked about that about Frankenstein and your own contracts, and I also think that a lot of um, I, uh, another comment on uh, Renee's question is, I see a lot of contract terms that are reactions to something, like something happened this weekend, I'm going to add something to my contract so that that doesn't happen again. And you just, it's an evolution. Um, but, you know, I certainly see the benefit of getting professional help with this, just like you would with your accountant or anything else or a doctor in your personal life. Um, the question here is uh, a couple of them. Um, give a uh, give us a horror story, something that uh, uh, like where people really like if this happens, you really need to get your butt down to an attorney to deal with this and not try to deal with it yourself. And or give us you know some common cases when a wedding pro should seek professional legal help in doing something. Right. So just if I could break it on down, like if you could leave this with one sentence, it's typically litigation and trying to get a court involved to adjudicate your matter is typically never worth it. So we work from that axiom backwards. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. your contract, it's important for an attorney to draft your contract specifically to you because the main principle is avoiding chasing money, avoiding lawsuits about money because 99% of the time it's about money. So making sure your contract deals with what happens if that event is canceled for whatever reason, where does the money go? Who holds on the money and why is the number one thing. So that's, that's what I would say in terms of like 
you know, when to get an attorney, you want to get an attorney up front to draft the contract. Okay, fair, fair enough, fine. What, when should I get one if there's some type of dispute? Um, unfortunately, the last statistic that I saw, there are 1.3 million attorneys in the country. So some, one of us is getting married or our sons or daughters are getting married. So if you get a letter with, you know, you know, Finkel and Einhorn at the top, or whatever it is, like, you, you know, we're going to, we're threatening you with the lawsuit and they actually have purchased a lawyer uh, that's not related to them. That's when I would probably talk to a lawyer. Everything less than that, um, you know, it's probably good if you can afford it to talk to somebody. But I think that everybody works off of that axiom because if a couple is mad at you and they don't have that family attorney and they want to go to an attorney, that attorney is going to go, you give me money and I'll tell you how you can sue your wedding professional. So they're getting that axiom too, because at the end of the day, no one wants to spend the money. And even if they spend the money, it's, you're going to be throwing good, uh, good money after bad. So I try to say up until the point where you, where a couple is so mad that they have gone to a non family member attorney and you get that letter in the mail, it's, you know, it's, it's official. That's when I talk to an attorney, but everything else, you know, watch one of y'all's, you know, podcasts about dispute resolution or cust a good customer service or watch an Alan Berg um, webinar or something like that. That's going to get you out of trouble often, more often than an attorney consultation, if that makes sense. Like I gave a presentation at the wedding MEA a few years ago about dispute resolution, about how saying, what can I do to make this right is far more powerful than um, I'm going to talk to my attorney about. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense, especially and as you know, you can win in the court of law and you're still going to get roasted in the court of Facebook and Yelp and Instagram and, exactly. or your wedding wire reviews or you know, what, there are so many ways that you can be harmed. And I I've seen, I had a, a client a few months ago that, and they were in a big dispute over a couple of hundred dollars. And it's a like just, it's worth, giving them the money back, even though it pains you, even though you know you're right and they're wrong, just to keep it out of social media. It is well worth the investment of, um, of just sometimes you just have to suck it up and give the money back. That's exactly right. I mean, that's, I couldn't have said it any better than that. You got to do the cost benefit analysis of, of a refund in exchange for essentially silence or in, in exchange for don't sue me. And that, and sometimes that's worth it. And op, most oftentimes it's worth it. What have you seen um, people sometimes put in their contracts some sort of a, I promise not to write a bad review clause? So that's a, an excellent question. And, and that, that type of law is still fluid. In some states, in, and we're talking about the the contract that your client signs at the beginning of the relationship. Correct. Okay? So in some states, for example, California, that is illegal. You cannot do that. Okay. Some states like in Georgia, I mean, as long as you're not, you know, contracting for drugs or to murder somebody, you can, you can put whatever you want in there. Okay. So from a legal standpoint, it may or may not be legal in your state. And there are more states that are doing that. Um, it's kind of, you know, I mean, say what you will about it infringement of free speech, blah, 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 but, you know, from a statutory matter, you can't do it. From a business standpoint, again, I would defer to people that are, are like such as yourselves in regards to whether or not it's a good idea from a customer relations standpoint. If I ever saw a contract where it said I can't give them a bad review, I'm running away from that. You know, I, I listened to your video on defamation or your, your podcast video. I, I'm watching it on YouTube, but it's obviously a podcast. Um, but can you talk a little bit about that, the short version? Because it was kind of eye-opening to me that you can repeat something, especially because we have the internet, you know, and Facebook and everything nowadays, that somebody can repeat something and then they can be labeled as a defendant also. That was eye-opening. Yeah. yeah, so... Uh, the, the concept is, if I remember correctly, and again, I was talking about taking five bars. I think it's republication is the actual legal term of art for it. So like if I, if, if someone says, um, you know, Rob steals money from clients, 
okay? And we'll just assume that's not true and that's defamatory. That's not the one you used on YouTube. You said if the videographer poops in the punch bowl. I'm, just, I, I, I'm impressed. I'm glad you're, you're, you actually are watching these well, videos. I appreciate it. I get that. I mean, yeah, you pictured it. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll continue with that example. So if the videographer poops in the punch, or I say videographer A poops in the punch bowl, right? Yeah. Um, if my cousin <laughs> repeats that, even though my cousin is not the originator of the statement, I am, he is also could be potentially a defendant in that slander or libel lawsuit. So the only, well, I'm going to say the only, the primary exceptions to that rule are websites like Yelp, Google, The Knot, Wedding Wire, wherever you have a forum where it's like, all right, guys, just do the best you can. They don't have an obligation really, well, that obligation, they, they are not, uh, susceptible to lawsuits under a federal law that was passed like 20 years ago. So, but yes, if you repeat something that's defamatory, just because you're not the one that made it up, if you repeat it, you could be on the hook. <laughs> I can fun. tell you that when we did our pre-show prep here, I never thought I would hear about the videographer putting in the punch bowl. Okay. Um, hey, you don't know what you're going to get when you listen to Rob's <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. And you know, it's, and I got to think about like, all right, well, I got to get past like the, the Apple podcast censors. So I'll just say poop. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's <laughs> an editorial decision. Yeah. <laughs> we have a question about retainer fees. We should touch on that. The deposit is any distinction between calling them a deposit and calling that's them a, a retainer that's fee. A that's a whole and, podcast. And, uh, and is a 50%, is there any kind of maximum that's reasonable or is that just between the buyer and the seller? I'm gonna hire Renee as my, as my, as my um, hype man. Um, so yeah, um, okay, all, all good questions, right? So um, in my experience, in my anecdotal research um, of the states that I'm licensed in and dealing with clients, typically it's not as important as what you call it in terms of retainer versus deposit. It's the language that surrounds it. You must be explicit to avoid trouble. You must be explicit in what happens to that money and why. So deposit X goes back to the client if this happens or doesn't go back if this happens is more important than just calling it deposit of X, if that makes sense. So um, being explicit with what happens is not as important. Um, I always, you know, not to rehash that podcast episode, but like, um, Sometimes these words like deposit or retainer have their own baggage in the mind of the client. So it might not be preferable to use them just from a, a customer relations standpoint rather than a legal standpoint, because deposit is a word that we, we infer is going to come back to us at some point because we've all signed leases um, when we were younger um, that, you know, if you're going to get to deposit back from your lease at some point, and maybe that's in the mind. So, um, calling it other things might be preferred, um, but again, that might be jurisdictional. Um, I was going to say something else. I think I'll, it'll come to me. Well, you had you had said in the podcast you had said different things you could call it would be an installment. Correct. So installment is I I prefer installment, and again, take this for what it's worth, but I prefer installment versus other things. And for the idea that I would like to protect my clients all of their payments. So rather than it being the idea that only the first payment, oh, it's percentages, Mark. Okay, I got it now. Okay, so um, so the idea of just the first payment being a non-refundable liquidated damages, it's possible, depending on where you're at, to make all those payments non-refundable and all those payments representative of a liquidated damages concept. Okay, the other part of that question that I remember now that I forgot is, um, preferred percentages? And is there a percentage that works or doesn't work? And that is actually going to depend on your jurisdiction. So liquidated damages as a concept varies from state to state. And so without getting into all the esoteric elements of liquidated damages, it, from a broad standpoint, regardless of where you're at, it should be representative or as close to representing your skin in the game throughout the duration of the contract. So the day after you sign that contract, you might not have as much skin in the game as you do the day before the event. So the day before the event, 
under liquidated damages theory, you would be um, more likely to be allowed to have 100% of the contract value. Some states don't, like, because that's the question, like, well, Rob, can I make 100% of my contract value? One payment, they owe me at the first day as liquidated damages, can I do that? In some states, in a lot of states, you cannot. So percentage does matter. It cannot be aggressive. Now, if they pay you it in full, that's just bonus. That was their choice. You, you, correct. And if you can do that, then hats off to you. That's awesome. <laughs> but in terms of if they cancel the next day, then your state law is going to tell you whether or not you can keep 100% of that or not. Now, let's touch on, which is, of course, the big topic these days are all of the plethora of postponements, cancellations related to COVID-19. Are you seeing anything different, anything special? Are courts looking at things differently now as a result of this? Are they throwing out contracts? What are you, I mean, this, what are you hearing with that sure. whole topic these days? No, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. So um, right now, it, things move slowly in the law, okay? So right now, uh, I've seen maybe five or six true force majeure cancellation, no deposit going back, lawsuits filed across the country. We got them in Oklahoma. I've seen them in Virginia. Um, so we're in the baby stages right now. So what's happening is that they're filing motions to dismiss or whatever. And then, um, you know, it, it essentially to learn um, how the law is going to adapt to the situation things have to do, you have to go up on appeals is kind of the, the concept. Somebody has to get a ruling they don't like, and it's got to go up to an appellate court. And the appellate courts are really the courts that, that generate the law that we look at for drafting contracts. So we're still probably a year or two away from getting any information with regard to the event industry and how force measures are going to affect it. But I'm excited because I mean, like typically force majeure law, common law, the, the court opinions that we read for contracts, they deal with typically one-off events that affect one event. In this situation, we're dealing with a worldwide catastrophic event that has affected every single event in the world. So this is going to be something I think that we're going to get, um, It's the law is going to change. Force majeure law is going to change. But my advice as we're sitting here right now is to the extent that you are signing up people now for any event that's going to be less than a year and a half from now, don't wait for courts. Go ahead and in your contract, talk about how you want that event to go down. Okay. If that, if, if that event, if, you know, having an event with PPE or, or physical distancing, is that okay? If it's not okay, then you need to make sure that's explicit. If, if it's not okay, what happens if, if something occurs where you got to do that because of the, the ordinances or the executive orders? These things need to be in that contract because you don't want to wait for some judge's interpretation of force majeure that's coming a year from now. All right, we've got a question from the chat. Would a COVID-19 waiver of liability hold up for every person at a wedding if signed only by your client? This is referring to DJs being covered for promoting dancing. No, that's and a, therefore that's the, that's I'm assuming the only time not could, distancing. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to say that's the only thing I can answer definitively. No, because you to to. I guess from a from a broad standpoint, if I want to have someone waive their um, ability to sue me for my negligent conduct. That's between me and that person. I cannot contract with the client to waive my negligent conduct as to guests or attendees. I would either have to do that through um, individual contracts with everybody that I want to have waive my negligent um, conduct. Or in some instances, and you see this like when you go to baseball games or you go to, um, I don't know, events, rallies where you might press a button as, a, as somebody that wants to go to that event, you press a button that says, I'm waiving 
um, my right to sue somebody for the, the DJs or the event producers negligent conduct or if you you might go and you might see a sign if a sign is up okay um, or you might just go in the middle and, and holler at people and say hey don't sue me there's a spectrum of enforceable to getting to be less enforceable um, so no you and your client contract does not protect you from you giving the COVID to a guest okay um, and then there is a jurisdictional differences with regard to liability for giving somebody COVID or even just negligently hurting somebody, okay? And I shouldn't say negligently, just hurting somebody because some states don't allow you to do that. Some states say, I don't care what that piece of paper says. If you are negligent and you hurt somebody, you are liable for that. Some states allow you to waive your, have the client waive your negligent behavior, which is kind of a, it's a standard right here. Um, and the, the example that I, I gave in a recent podcast about this is if I'm a florist and I'm carrying my flowers, my big flower face, and I'm not paying attention and I drop it on somebody's foot. I was being negligent because I wasn't being, I wasn't paying attention, okay? I was breaching what's called the standard of care and as somebody holding a pot that's heavy. Then there's a standard and some states don't allow you to waive this level of, of of culpability, but it's gross negligence or, or something close to gross negligence. And that's if I was drunk carrying the, the flower pot, okay, and drops it on somebody's foot. And then the next level is, is usually what we call intentional conduct. Some states, most states don't allow you to have your client waive intentional conduct because that would be ridiculous because that would mean that I could just punch you in the face and you can't sue me for it, right? So, um, so to sum up on that, um, if you want to be completely protected in terms of guests, not just your client, but guests, you need to do some type of written thing or signage or something like that to protect yourself. And even within your jurisdiction, depending on what you did, your behavior, you might not be protected because you might not have been negligent. You might have been grossly negligent or it might be considered intentional. Can, can we talk about that signage? Because I'm trying to picture that for, for the DJs. Um, would that be something that they could put on all four walls? You can see it on every area of the dance floor and then take pictures of it and document that it was at that wedding, that everybody would have seen it. Mm -hmm. I, I you know can, you can do these things. Um, but like I said, it's on a spectrum of like, is a jury going to go for it? Because I mean, you're at a wedding, like, are you paying attention to some eight by 12 piece of paper on the wall? And then if you make it a huge billboard, no one wants to go into that reception hall. And even so, um, you know, what does it mean to be, continue to stay in there just because you saw that that sign? It would probably have to see something like, if you don't if you don't want to accept this, you have to leave, right? So it's not just a matter of I'm putting you on notice that you can't sue me. It has to be an exchange of something, really, um, without getting into the huge. In other words, I would probably look to other means to protect yourself from that as opposed to a sign and and um i had a i i had a discussion with the with an attorney on this who's a defense attorney that's an insurance defense attorney so she's the attorney that defends the dj when they get sued because they get COVID 19 to somebody so some great steps to protect yourself are to adhere to whatever your local guidelines are so for example um if, if you're required to wear a mask, wear a mask, okay? If, you know, if you want to be super, super duper, get one of those thermometers where you can aim it at somebody's forehead and take your own temperature, take the temperature of your team, okay? Um, have policies and procedures. Hey, team, don't show up if you're coughing. Don't show up if you're, you know, have a fever, or whatever the case may be. Have a policy and procedures in place and follow them through. With the idea of all these things, guys, that typically you're not going to be liable for hurting somebody if you're not negligent. So if you've did all those things, then a jury can't be like, well, you know, that th you were negligent, but no, I didn't. I, I, I took the temperature of my team. The temperature was good. Um, I've got a policies and procedures in place. We wore masks. We were six feet apart, disinfected, you know, hand sanitizer, all that. Then, then that's going to help protect you. Because again, like I said, you, you have to have culpable behavior 
in order to be sued for that. If that makes sense. Perfect. Great answer. All right. Anybody else uh, questions in the chat? We will ask Rob. Um, so prior to the craziness of COVID nineteen, what um, what do you hear? What do you hear most of all on a day to day basis? I'm, I'm still fascinated this whole this niche that you have found in this uh, uh, in this wedding business, and I'm sure you found it. I, I can only imagine that there's a huge need for it. Uh, I was, I will tell you, joke when, when Renee and I were prepping for this, I was joking about, all right, so when Rob went to career day <laughs> at law school and there were all the tables of all the different kinds of law that you could go to, how did he end up at the, uh, the wedding law table? That's, uh, um, how did you land in, uh, in this very narrow area of, uh, the business? So I started off as um, a business lawyer. So doing contracts, litigating breach of contract situations. Um, and this is maybe going on 10 or 12 years now. And so at the time I was dating a wedding photographer. And so I was really good at contracts. I was really good at dispute resolution and, and litigating contract matters. Let me see your contract. And it wasn't very good. So like, okay, well, let me see this. And so I know pro approaching it from a legal standpoint, you know, different protections, but I didn't know the parlance. I didn't know the, um, you know, the, the standard of procedure for wedding photographers. So I'll learn wedding photography, um, not, not literally, but like, okay, well, what does it mean overage? What does that mean? What does it mean, you know, photojournalism versus this? And so from there, I kind of learned how to refine the language in the contract to reflect wedding photography. And from there, it just kind of blossomed. Like I just went and did some wedding venue contracts and then got on the speaking circuit and then you kind of got known and the more you do it, the better you get, the more you learn the industries. And so that's kind of, you know, I've been doing that for going on 12 years now. Um, just learn, learn, learning. I mean, I still learn every day. Like, I mean, they're, 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 you know, I, that's one of the good things of, you know, when you're going over a contract with somebody and they tell you something, it's like, man, I never, I never thought of that. You know, um, there's no like MBA for wedding florists. You know what I'm saying? So you just, you just learn it over time and, maybe something that you learn won't make it over to where another state or whatever for a while. But anyway, um, so uh, crazy things that I'm seeing outside of COVID-19, um, it really is, um, it, uh, and this is aside from like, you know, people drunk and getting into fights. I mean, that's not something that I'm gonna handle. But most of the time when there is a dispute between two people, it has to do with money. And 95, 99% of the time that it has to do with money, it has to do with the fact that that wedding was canceled and the people want their money back. Um, and so that's why it comes down to always, that should be in terms of real estate on that, that paper, real estate in terms of space on your contract, a, a good deal of it needs to do with money and what happens to money if that event is canceled. Um, so yeah, and then you, know, you get people, I feel like in the last 18 months before COVID, I'm getting clients that want to know how to fire clients. So like be people being offensive and being mean. Um, that's what I've been seeing uh, uh, and, and, and advising people on a lot in the past. And then what happened in the last, oh, it was a, um, a wedding videographer, which is, it turns out he's not a wedding videographer. He's just a scam artist. Was this the um, poop in the punch bowl one? No, it's a different. It's a different guy. He probably would poop in the punch bowl, but he he goes around. He's basically a grifter and goes from city to city, just putting out Craigslist ads for videography, and people give him money, and then he never shows up. And then at some point, a um, the bride to be died in a car wreck, and so the groom to be um, emailed and was like, "Can I get my money back? My my fiance died." And he said no, and then went and defamed them. And was like, I'm glad, or not, I'm glad she's dead, but like something. Oh yeah, we saw like this that. story. Yeah, and so it turns out, I mean, obviously he's crazy, but um, he's he's a scam artist. Like he was never going to videotape the wedding anyway. He does it, you know, dozens of times, and then re just renames his his business in another state. So that's the craziest story I've seen in, in a minute. Yeah, and you did the podcast on that too. Um, but that was, yeah, that made national news. That was, I mean, everybody picked up that one and picked up the sword. Uh, that was ridiculous. Yeah. 
it's 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 crazy. So, but yeah, um, with COVID related stuff, we're dealing now with. I'm getting calls about like, you know, do I have to wear masks? Do you know? Can I sue the governor? You know, this type of stuff. Um, and then, you know, um, what was in? I, I didn't consult somebody with this, but I was going to do a video on it. But um, whether or not, and this goes back to firing a client, but whether or not you can fire a client based on, you know ideology like you find out later that somebody is for or pro something and you want to terminate that contract based on that like morality clauses it so to speak what um so what i and I've, I've been in this business for a long time and i have seen whenever we come out of a recession or some calamity in our in our in our space a lot of people tend to gravitate to the wedding industry. I lost my job, damn it, I'm never getting a pink slip again, I'm gonna start my own business. And it tends to bring, just for a variety of reasons, the low barriers to entry being one of them, it brings a lot of new people into the wedding business. And I'm expecting that we're gonna see that uh, even more and more now, once we get to back to some semblance of normal and weddings start happening again, I think we're going to see that. What is the, you know, what is your two or three best pieces of advice to a new business? I'm getting ready to go into this wedding industry. I'm going to start a business. Um, from a legal perspective, what, what are some must do things that, uh, uh, that that new entrant to the wedding industry should do? So from the, one of the first things is decide how you're going to operate in terms of a business. And what I mean by that is, are you going to be, are you going to form an LLC and protect yourself that way? Are you going to be a C-Corp? Are you going to be a sole proprietor? And the reason why that's probably one of the threshold questions is because that deals with limiting you as a new business owner, your liability in case you do something wrong, anything from dropping something on somebody's foot to, um, you know, not doing a good job of being super rich a contract. So the, the idea of an LLC um, is that it separates the assets of the business from the assets of the person. That's the whole point. One of the whole points of, of forming an LLC or a corporation is to separate your, your things from the business's things. So in case the, you, your business does have a creditor, they're not going after your house or your car. They're going after the assets of the business. Um, so proprietor, not so much. So proprietor, there is essentially no difference between the business and the person. And if you're going to do that, um, it's probably uh, beneficial to get some type of liability insurance or different types of insurance to protect you because you're not going to have the protection in terms of a shield around your assets that an LLC or corporation would. So that's the first thing is, understanding how you're going to tackle the business formation um, idea. The second thing is to essentially figure out your client contract situation. So whatever you're doing the most of, which is, you know, closing on clients, so either be a videographer, florist, planner, or whatever, that document that you provide the, to the uh, client, that's important that, you know, you get consultation on that. Um, because that's the next line of defense for you. Mostly it's gonna be a line of defense for your money, but you wanna protect yourself in that way. And those are the those are the two, if there's like a pie chart, like a giant pie chart, I, in my opinion, those are the two biggest pieces of pie that you need to take care of at the beginning. I had something happen the other day that was kind of interesting for, I was filling out a, a, another grant um, for going through this, um, it was a, a state grant and one of the things and there's a whole bunch of people going in after it and it's not a time thing it's just who fills out all the information and one of the questions I found interesting I mean I I'm sure it was wasn't for this but I've never had it asked for a long time it asked me to show my fictitious name document and I thought I knew exactly where it was. I went to, I'm an LLC. I went right to my book, my, my lawyer had given me. And I thought about that. I thought, you know what? That might be just a way just to see, you know, if they're gonna pick who gets these grants, they wanna make sure, did you dot all your I's and cross all your T's? 
So I easily had that. I had my fictitious name that I'm operating under. Um, I submitted it. So um, when people are starting these new companies, and I'm thinking this is a federal law, but it, it, it might not be, but is it true that if you use your name, your first name and or last name, you do not have to file a fictitious name with your state? Or is that, this that's going to be state specific. Okay. So, um, but there, 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 this comes under the idea of doing business as or whatever. But if you're, you know, Rob Schink LLC, that's, that's, that's fine. But if you're, you know, I don't know, the wedding lawyer or Rob Schink doing business as the wedding lawyer, that's going to be different from whatever state you're in, in terms of the process by which you do that. In the if, if, if you're cakes by Gina, I think there could be a lot of Gina, but so that wouldn't work as a sole proprietorship, right? It would probably be cakes by Gina Smith. Well, I, th I think, I mean, you, well, we're getting into different things now. I think that, um, you know, if you want to be cakes by Gina, um, as long as there are no other cakes by Gina that you would be infringing on some type of mark in your state or in the country, then you're okay. But in terms of like, well, Rob, well, how, how do I, establish that with the government to pay taxes and stuff like that. If you're a sole proprietor, and I'm not an expert at this, but I believe you're filing just a personal income tax anyway, because you're sole proprietor. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. But again, um, check with your state. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah. So I don't, I don't know Pennsylvania law. Or, I think yeah. that's exactly what Pennsylvania law is. Okay, so as a new business, and of course, again, the low barriers to entry in the wedding business, and people oftentimes it ventures from being a hobby into a business, and it's just sort of an evolution. And, you know, that's where problems arise, because they never did actually get the legal advice, the accounting advice and all that. But just, and I know it can be all over the place, but what should a new business estimate as their investment in legal services to do things the right way and get set up on the right foot? Um, th this will be jurisdictional. Okay. But I would argue that you would have to, and I'm not, I'm not a tax person. I'm not a CPA, but in my opinion, you would have to argue to me why you shouldn't form an LLC uh, as opposed to a C corp or being a sole proprietor. It's cheap. In most states, you can do it with three clicks of a mouse. Um, it's it's it provides you that protection. So um, I think in most states you can do that for less than two hundred dollars, and you can do it on your own. It's designed to be easy. Like we we live in a country where we, we want entrepreneurship. We want people to go out and, do, and 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 start companies. We want that. So we've made the LLC process in most states easy. Some states. A little bit more bureaucracy, but I would argue that you know, of course, you could, if you can afford it, talk to an attorney about it. But you could probably do that yourself um, if you want to, if you were so inclined. Um, but outside of that, you, in order to get an LLC formed or whatever, get advice on what business entity that you would need, which is probably going to be an LLC unless you've got investors or you've got partners or you got six people or, or in a year you want to franchise. Outside of those things, if you just want to sell flowers at weddings for the foreseeable future, you could probably be get your contract done, get your LLC form for less than twelve hundred dollars, depending on what state you're in. Like California would be more expensive, New York would be more expensive, Georgia will be less expensive, Mississippi will be even less expensive. Um, that's just the nature of you know inflation and prices across the country. Like you'd be amazed at the hourly rate of, a, of an attorney in New York City versus Mobile, Alabama. Um, so, but I, I think that no matter where you go, you could probably get it done for less than that. Okay. And, I, and if I could say one more thing, I, I thought I'm hogging the mic, but <laughs> I, would, I would try to, and this is hard, I mean, but I mean, we have the internet now, okay? But you wanna only work with attorneys that work on a flat fee. You never wanna work for an attorney that does something by the hour. That is an outdated model that is not beneficial, in my opinion, to the client. 
So if it's like I want an LLC formed or I want advice on what business formation or I want a contract, whatever it is, you should be asking for a quote that doesn't change. It's like, okay, it's, it's $500 regardless or it's, you know, whatever. So um, that's definitely something you want to look for. But it goes without saying a worthwhile and yes, of course, your opinion is going to be biased, but, the, but it, it's just, it makes so much sense to do this. And I think that we're, you know, we're seeing now, and again, we read in the, in the groups, the venue groups and the DJ groups of like, you know, unfortunately, so many people learn the hard way that I should have done this the right way. And it's, you know, I know it's sexy and exciting to go out and buy your new cameras and buy your new equipment and all that. But, uh, you know, this is, I mean, to me, if you're going to be serious about this business uh, in making the investment on the legal side and on the financial side, the accounting side, it's just so important. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to have you on here this evening. I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, and, and to, to just to piggyback off that really quickly is the, is the idea that hopefully your attorney, I know that I'm providing anecdotal advice to people. So like when somebody's like, well, Rob, like how do I structure my installments? How much percentage? I can tell them like, well, this is typically what I'm seeing. And that's a piece of information if you're new that you might not get unless you're, you know, getting it from some other group or whatever. So, you know, it's just like that. Yeah. Like if you're in a group or whatever it is, your CPA, whatever you, that has experience in that area, that's, that's a benefit aside from the fact that you're going to get a contract from them. So how does someone get a hold of Rob if they have questions or want a referral or are in oh, Georgia? I know. And one of I know. I know. How do we do that? Do you know? How's oh, that? Wow. Cool. Oh, that's, that's me right there. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Do you go to all those things? But if, 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 yeah, if you got any questions, email me. Um, I would love it forever if people could subscribe to my YouTube channel. That would be the best thing. And I'll answer all the questions you got if you subscribe to my YouTube channel. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's the, the best flat fee of all. Subscribe yeah. <laughs> and get your questions answered. Yeah. <laughs> well, we thank you so much. And when you said you were hogging the mic, I just, I would have to laugh at that because that is exactly why we wanted you here. Hey, how do I get myself like that? <laughs> <Appreciate> that <yeah. laughs> of course I did that. Well, anyways, I don't know how to go back to that on the way. There we go. There we go. <laughs> I've got all these buttons. I don't know what I'm pushing. But thank you for joining us here on our um, our live here. And we're representing Team Wedding, uh, which does your team wedding marketing. What do we do? We do your marketing. So you can make cakes and you can do the other fun things you want. You can give that to us because we've been doing that for 27 years and Mark's been doing it for 26 because um, he's younger than me. And um, so. Invest in the legal side of your business, invest in the financial side and invest in your marketing. And um, with that, we're going to say good night and thank you again so much, Rob. We will see you on the speaking circuit soon. Thank you. See you guys thank soon. Bye-bye.